Good morning and welcome to Community Roundtable, a free public service brought to you on AM 1590 KDJS. If you're a member of a nonprofit organization and would like to be featured on the program, call the KDJS Newsline at 320-235-2900. That's 320-235-2900. Community Roundtable on AM 1590 KDJS and 105.7 FM. Al Sheldon here with Jill Winutka from the Candioy County Historical Society. Joining us on what will be a busy last two and a half weeks of the year, uh, two and a half months of the year, I guess. Jill, how are you doing this morning? Pretty good, pretty good. Well, it's happy to see the sun. <laughs> glad you had the time to, to come on in. Yeah, nice to see some dry weather. I mean, mm-hmm. our, our people that are out harvesting crops certainly appreciate what, what Mother Nature's given us finally. Yes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do you live right in town? Or? No, I actually live in Bird Island. Bird Island? So I get to do the drive up and I get to see all the farmers in the fields. Mm-hmm. So it's awesome to see yeah, all the yes. combines trucking busy time of the year mm-hmm. we did a little driving just recently and and uh looking up and down the the fields and this was when it was still pretty wet but there were some guys out on the high ground yep yep definitely doing, doing what they could we it looks a little at, patchworky <laughs> we were down at fort ridgely state park camping oh. for a weekend a uh, couple of weeks back and uh, love that place gosh and and to come up out of the valley and like say to see mm-hmm. the fields and everybody working and and uh, when you walk where history was mm-hmm. made all those years ago, and, and that's what we're here to talk about today is history of the Candy Eye County Historical Society. So much that you folks have going on, it's a big pile we get to dig into, but I do know that uh, coming up this Friday, one of your annual events is dinner at the Sperry House. You've already had people that have signed up and, and uh, people selected to luckily be at the dinner for a, what I call a small donation of $5. Yeah, yeah. It's a raffle that we've been doing for, I believe this might be the 15th year. It's We've been doing it for over 10 years, and mm. it's one of our biggest fundraisers for the Sperry House. Um, all the proceeds from every ticket that you buy, even if you don't win, goes to um, keeping the Sperry House alive and running. <laughs> so we, one year we built storage in our storage room. One year we replaced the card tables we use for the tea. And then we have those lovely maintenance problems with an old home that mm. creep up every year. And so those that this um, fundraiser helps us um, take care of those those issues too. So we really thank everybody who supported it. And um, we love our Sperry House and we hope to come up with new programming to use it more in the future. So, Well, the Sperry House is, is right right by the historical society. Yep, it's part of our complex. It's yep. of North Business 71. Uh, what's the history of the Sperry House? Well, um, actually, in 2018, it turned 125 years old. Wow. So it was built in 1893 by Albert and Jenny Sperry. Um, Albert and his family came to Candyoy County in the 1850s and settled over by Atwater. And then they eventually, Albert eventually moved into Wilmer. And it was um, a beautiful farmhouse. And then he had an operating farm. Um, down the road on Puerto Rico was the only bridge that came across the railroad before First Street. So he was right at the you know foot of that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and he had a meat market and an implement shop downtown, and he was always involved with politics and the community, um, a Civil War veteran. Um, so they built that home, and um, he lived there till he died. So And then we've always had a Sperry living there, and we were given the house in 1970 when their youngest son Brian died. Um, and we've had it ever since. And two years ago, we eliminated our caretaker position, which was the second floor apartment. So now that's empty. And uh, we're in the process, a multi-year process, I'm going to tell people. <laughs> it's not going to happen overnight um, to open up the second floor to the public. So, A lot of work to be done. It, it, it's special work. Uh, do you have to have specific types of contractors and and, and deals done because it is an historical uh, house? Yes. I mean, we, we want to maintain the integrity. So the first the first thing we needed to do is get it on the National Historic Register, and we're working on that right now. So we did an evaluation as a grant, and we hired somebody to do an evaluation, and the State Historic Preservation Office said that it's eligible. So now I just submitted a grant two weeks ago um, to write the nomination. Um, and so we should know by this time next year if it is on the National Historic Register, but that opens us up for more grants so that we can do, because we have to, you know, you have to look at the structure of the house first before we do an interpretation. Mm. It hasn't been, a lot of the structure stuff hasn't been done for over 20 years, so we need to re, re-look at that. The roof, the brick, you know, the 
the heating and cooling. There's no temperature, environmental control on that house. All we have is heat, no cooling. And to have a museum environment, you need both. So um, there's a lot of um, not fun stuff to do. (laughs) You know, like there's going to be a lot of work and a lot of money put into it, but you won't get to see that until we actually do an exhibit, which would be the last part of the process so you, you will feel the work that was done without seeing it yes you will you will and we'll be able to have better lighting and better you know and it'll be open more because of the you know all this stuff so um, if people are patient it took us six years to do the first floor so it's going to take us a couple years to get the second floor and we do little sneak peeks we had a celebration in july and um, the tour guide let everybody go up and look when they came that day so um, sometimes all you have to do is ask and we'll, we can show you at the second floor. <laughs> mm-hmm. So what's it like up there? It's empty. <laughs> it's, well, what are the walls? Are plaster? Or? Yeah, they're plaster. And now in the 1920s, they divided it into two apartments. So there's some false walls where closets were built. Um, and there's a kitchen in there. There's a washer and dryer up there, you know, cause people were living in there till 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a shower and a toy, you know, it's a, a bathroom, mm-hmm. a modern one. So, um, but it has still, it's pr- it's the size of the downstairs. So there's a beautiful living room. The bedroom has a stained glass window in it. You know, it's, mm-hmm. um, there's three bedrooms upstairs. What, what era is it decorated in? The upstairs or yeah, the, the downstairs? downstairs. We, we do the turn of the cent Victorian because it's a Victorian farmhouse, a Queen Anne. So we do turn of the century being the turn of into the 20th century um so we have some things from the sperry's not very many um at the 125th uh albert's great grandson from ohio was able to visit us and they brought oodles of pictures Mm -hmm. and family information and then they brought a few objects that which we put over in the sperry house Um, and then two years ago we did a complete inventory of all of our objects so three-dimensional um and we found so many more things that we have of the spirit, so we've been bringing those over to the house, too, to add more to that. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, man, and is that open the same hours or just by appointment only? It, well, we through, well, in the summer, so April through September, we'll do a Thursdays is when we do tours. Um, but you can always make an appointment, and mm-hmm. we can do it any day. Um, now, this winter, we're going to decorate it. So starting November 3rd through the end of December, it's going to be decorated for Christmas. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we're going to try a Christmas tea on December 1st. So if anybody wants to sign up, they can call the museum. The first one's at 11. The second one's at 1. It's $20 for members and 25 if you're not a member. Limited supply of seating, I suppose, right? 16 per setting. So 16 at 11 and 16 at 1, and we already have some people signed up. The first so. of December, once again. So 235-1881. Uh, Easy number to remember, 1881. It, exactly, yeah. <laughs> That's the year Gary Andreessen died. <laughs> that was a very, very good year right? yeah. for some folks. Anyway. For some folks, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if I were to walk in and ask anything about Candy Eye County history, would you have it at your fingertips? Well, close to our fingertips. You just have to come in our research room, and we'll uh, do our hardest to find it. We have a beautiful research room um, that, uh, and then I would advise you to go to Bob, my coworker, because he's our our researcher. Mm -hmm. If you want to find something, he's the guy that will find it for you. Um, But we have a library which contains family histories. We have photos. Um, We have all of our stuff, majority of our stuff on our software program. So we can type in, like if you want to learn about radio, Candy White County, we can just type in radio. I can find out, I could walk in and find out about specifically the history of Wilmer, Mm -hmm. Spicer, New London, Raymond, any town in the county. Yeah, any town in the county, any business in the county. Mm -hmm. Um, Right now we have a volunteer looking up the sports stories, and we're going to index those. I mean, anything. So it's not just family history. We can find out anything. Students can come in. um, You know, anybody can come in and look whatever you want. We have oodles of pictures, so if you need some pictures, maps. I mean, they're just... Our archives is very, very, very big. So you get a lot of a lot of school groups come through. Um, we do. We get them in May usually. Um, and they they're usually Wilmer and we get Prinsburg and New London Spicer. So they're from mm-hmm. around the area. Um, and it's kind of it's a fun day. We do stations to all of our um six buildings, so they kind of rotate because we have the, you know the engine in the schoolhouse. We have a log cabin, the Sperry House, and then we have an egg, an egg building, and then our main museum. So. Well, talk about uh, exhibits coming up. You're going to be uh, featuring World War One real soon, right? 
Yeah, the Canyon County Historical Society is part of a group called the West Central Minnesota Historical Association. And uh, that association wrote three grants in order to get this traveling exhibit on World War One in West Central Minnesota. So it's not just Candiwai County it will cover. There's 10 counties in our group that it covers, but we get to be the first ones to host it. So the people up in this neck of the woods are the first ones to see the exhibit. So we're very excited about that. You know what the exhibit will encompass in? It has five, um, five themes. Um, and there's, it's, uh, there are boxes, and then you go in, and we're going to put it right by our World War One exhibit, so you can check out the Candyway County one that we did, along with the West Central one. Um, so it's soldier life, um, what life was like at home, when the soldiers came back, um, and then, uh, oh, now I forgot the fourth one. You'll have to come and check it out. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I just, I'm stumped. But, um... It, it'll be exciting. Um, so that goes until the end of November. That war uh, was the war that was going to end all of the wars. Uh, and it was so long ago, as we were talking about before going on the air this morning, mm -hmm. that uh, there aren't any people left from the war. Not and, uh, from some that Some of the relatives are getting mm -hmm. very old also. Yeah. Like my great-grandfather was one, but that was my great-grandfather, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, so it's it's one of those things that we have to keep telling the story and teaching people so that that's not one that's forgotten um, and uh, we uh, that's why we wanted to do this exhibit um, it's the 100th anniversary of Armistice Day on November 11th so that's why we're opening it close to November and it's going to run all over West Central Minnesota for the next two years so and you're involved uh, this is involved uh, 10 counties the the West Central Association yes. here. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All, of our, all of our neighboring counties and you know, a little bit beyond so yep yep so that that's cool and, and November 3rd uh, saw this note here that you passed along uh, via our modern day electronics recently yes. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, saturday november 3rd uh, date uh, celebrating people who serve or have served the community and uh and yeah uh, that'll be saturday from 10 until 3 30 dollars for uh, uh photography option what's that all about well another way to highlight the Sperry house <laughs> um we have on our board uh gregory harp who's a photographer from new london and he is willing to come um, between 10 and 3 on that same day. And we're going to have it decorated for Christmas. So people can come. If you give a $30 donation to the Historical Society, he will take your picture and you get the digital image. And you can take it and make a poster, make a canvas, make a Christmas card, whatever you want of your, um, of your family or your friends or just yourself. You could come and get your own portrait taken. Um, what we're using as a fundraiser for the Historical Society um, and it's something new we're trying this year because we want to we, we're trying to figure out new ways to use the Sperry House and get people in there. So I see journalist Jennifer Rude Klett is going to be on hand that same day at 11 a.m. She is a, uh, the writer of a book and it is not made up. It is nonfiction. Doughboy mm -hmm. marching into the heart of Kaiser's Germany during World War One. That to me sounds like a very interesting read. <laughs> yeah, it is. And we sell it at the gift shop. So if anybody wants to come by and uh, purchase a copy ahead of time, they they sure can. They can go on our website, too. We have a gift shop online. Um, she came in 2014, and uh, she did a wonderful program. And we wanted to have her back. This is kind of to celebrate us having this traveling exhibit. And then Armistice Day and trying just to do some different things at the museum. So she'll be there at 11. She's going to do a nice presentation, and then books will be for sale, and there will be a question and answer, and that's free. And you do uh, that often on uh, with local folks as well who have written books about the area. Yes, absolutely. And if anybody has written a book and we don't know about it, let us know. You just have to contact me at the museum and I we can set up a, we'd love to do book signings and get you know the local artists and authors mm. out in the in the thing. We also do exhibits in our community room for local photographers and artists and quilters or whatever. So if you want to display any of your your goods, just let me know too because we're always looking for new new exhibitors too. I know recently uh, you hosted a friend of mine, Barb Levine, who was in with her book about uh, uh, Summit Candy Eye County, you know? Yeah, yeah. She Oh, that book's been selling really nicely. Good. <laughs> um, good. It's very good. Um, what she did is Gabriel Steeny wrote newspaper articles. It was like a weekly, maybe monthly column. And she compiled them all nicely into a book in chronological order. And you can buy it and read it all. And it's the history of... Candyway County from Gabriel Steeny's viewpoint, and it's it's very very interesting, and um, it's uh, we've had to we've had to reorder once already, so <laughs> which is I'll good. Just, I'll just let you know that you've never been on a mushroom hunt unless you've been with Barb and Larry. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Always we, fun. Yeah. You talk about decorating for Christmas. Uh, that sounds like a tall order. Yeah, it usually takes us about two days. Mm -hmm. um, now this year, this is the first year we're not going to do the festive forest in the museum. We've done that program for over 25 years. Mm -hmm. So we decided to kind of change gears a little bit. But we're still going to... There will be trees all over in the museum, so we'll still have that nice ambiance, um, and we'll have lights on them and stuff. It's just that we won't have that festive forest. Um, we're trying to come well, up with new I programs. Will I see different eras of holiday decor then? Or? Well, it depends on what we got in our archives. <laughs> 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 so we'll be putting those up now at the end of October, early November, um, so it'll be ready by November 3rd. Um, and you'll just have to come and check it out. That'll be great. That's, yeah. That goes up when? Um, November 3rd, it'll be ready for, for our 3rd, event okay. on the 3rd, yep. So the the house will be done up, uh, the museum, with, with, with Christmas lights, mm -hmm. with World War One. Yep. And uh, just a, a variety of things all at once. Yeah, yeah. Well, and our, um, we have, uh, our engine always gets light, lit uh -huh. up for Christmas, and uh, we're up in our game this year since the... The lights will be at Robbins Island. Mm -hmm. We're gonna. We have some new volunteers um, to to do it, and they uh, the plan they have is pretty cool. All right. So we're hopefully uh, we're talking that'll about the big steam engine right mm -hmm. out front off Business Seventy One. Now, if you if you've always wondered, well, where's the Historical Society building? Well, just look for the train. Exactly. <laughs> we're the train museum. <laughs> look, look for the big train. Out yeah. Front. Yeah. That is huge. It's ginormous. Yes. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And it's a way. I can't. Any idea? I I should know and i could look it up but i don't know off the top of my head it's got to be a big number it's, it's all I it, yeah exactly <laughs> um we just had a uh, we did the united way day of action this this year and had a bunch of high schoolers come and they scrubbed the engine down really we have a pigeon problem so yeah. we get a lot of uh droppings on the top and that is not good for the the metal and mm -hmm. stuff so that was cleaned up um right now we're trying to find donations to put um netting underneath there so the birds don't nest mm -hmm. um and then uh hopefully next year i can uh write a grant to get it painted i have noticed that kind of netting at some bank drive throughs mm -hmm. Uh, probably the same, same probably idea there. Yeah. yeah yeah we had a conservation report done in 2015 and he gave us like step by step this is what you need to do first second third so this we're following that mm -hmm. we clean it and then we do the bird netting and then the painting and then there'll be more um, conservation stuff that again most people won't see but we will know it's done yeah. to preserve the to preserve their engine but i can't wait to get it painted again and looking pretty well, when are they going to decorate it and have all the lights up and rolling it that's november 3rd too maybe no or? no the we're gonna do it for thanksgiving okay yeah that's what we've usually done for the train um so our engine it's not a whole train as my seven-year-old son tells me it's an engine <laughs> <laughs> those kids are pretty smart they, right? they are very smart <laughs> um so we're gonna do it we've always started in on thanksgiving mm -hmm. so and since our events during the day you can't really see the the lights very well during but the day it's going to get dark earlier and there will be a lot of people driving through the yeah. area with uh, the uh, robbins island regional park yep. uh, getting the the kuzman yes uh, decorations yep. donated to uh, the city for putting up over yeah there. it's going to be amazing yeah so we thought we could just you know as people are driving in they see the train and then oh it must be this way mm -hmm. <laughs> so well, yeah, yeah for the holiday season to stop in and and, and see christmas decoration from mm -hmm. from years gone by mm -hmm. yep that's always cool i mean we all have our memories as as youngsters of, of the old decorations we mm -hmm. had on our trees that we thought were so normal then now they're like wow yeah antiques you know? i know yeah i mean we're getting older <laughs> no 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 absolutely not <laughs> not yet anyway, not right? yet yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so. you don't have uh uh, the leg lamp from Christmas Story. <laughs> no, we don't have that. None of those. <laughs> no, no. Although I've thought it would be kind of fun to have a tree from every generation because it would be. My, I grew up in the '80s and '90s, and my generation still doesn't think they're old enough to give anything to the museum because it has to be antique, and it does not. So I want to, you know, if I can do a tree from the '80s with like star wars underneath mm -hmm. or you know hot wheels and stuff um that might bring people from my generation same with other generations well, um, 1985 is over 30 years ago i That's know right going back a little ways i yeah. know and people but they don't think they're you know old enough to donate things and you can donate something from yesterday because mm -hmm. it's already a history and if if we don't collect this stuff now 75 years from now they're going to be scratching for yeah. things to represent our generations so it's one of the tough things and we talked about this at home uh, right now if your kids are in their 20s and 30s like say they 
probably not into thinking that oh, I don't need that. That's just an old piece of furniture. Mm-hmm. And in reality, it's already an antique. Mm-hmm. You know, we have a table that is, my goodness, 70 or 80 years old mm-hmm. that we have dinner on every night. Yeah. And none of the kids want it. We were going to pass it down mm-hmm. to them, let them use it as they uh, got their own houses. Yeah. Uh, but they didn't want it. Really? You know, and I'm like, uh, well, we'll keep using it. Yeah. Not a problem. <laughs> they might and want it later. They, I'm, that's what I'm thinking. They will learn. They'll turn that corner in yes. life where they'll go, oh, remember that? I wonder mm-hmm. what happened to that. Yep. You know. Yep. I'm just an odd one because I thought that when I was like 18. <laughs> I, there's a few of us that think that way all through our lives but a lot of people even my you know my own my own family they're just like oh, we don't need that and it's such a disposable generation yeah. right now mm-hmm. that they just throw everything away so my mom and dad's pictures from the farm auction in 1978 yeah and the furniture they had then now would blow an antique dealer's mind away yeah you know yeah <laughs> oh, exactly man, crazy. yeah old, like it was old then yeah <laughs> well know? like we're looking for um we want to do like a 50s kitchen well, we would we don't have we don't have a lot of stuff from the fifties. So yeah. from fifties to now, we just don't cluck that. Nobody donates it, or we don't know where it is. So if anybody has tables or a stove or a fridge from the fifties, give me a call if you want to get rid I was of it. Say you, you do take donations. <laughs> we do. Yes. We're so, we're select. Oh, yeah. um, it it has to be something we don't have and we're in need of, or it has to have a really strong tie to Candyway County. Mm-hmm. Um, we have three storage rooms that are packed. And then we have all of our exhibits that already have artifacts on them. So we're very selective. So um, I do say no. And it is hard. I know people <laughs> don't think it is, but it is really hard to say no. Um, but we always try to lead you in another direction to give it mm. to a different historical society or somebody that we know is looking for something like that. So mm. it doesn't get thrown away. So. Yeah, I know you occasionally see uh, a few things on the local swap and sells that are mm-hmm. quite old. Yep. And in general, pretty reasonably priced too. they are yeah and we keep our eyes on those too because mm-hmm. um, if they're you know if they're cheap enough i'll i'll buy them <laughs> for the museum you know because <laughs> we know what we need so oh, yeah uh, gosh as i watch our timer we've got a few minutes left uh, okay. wanted to ask i'm guessing it's on your uh, software uh, in the in the research room but candy Oye county's history of the Dakota Indian War because there's quite a bit here. Yeah, and actually we have one of the sites belongs to the historical site, the Gurry Andreessen Cabin, which is one of the sites of the Mm -hmm. Dakota War. Um, That is a a huge part of our history and uh, we have uh, we have a lot of research done on that. Um, When we did the Civil War research project for the Civil War soldiers, of course a lot of those were Dakota War. Mm -hmm. Not they didn't ever go south, but they fought in the Dakota War, so they're considered Civil War soldiers. So we found a lot more of the people who served and um, we have historic markers throughout mm. our county. And I've seen a few. I've yeah, a few. Yeah. yeah <laughs> um, 26 of them have to do with the Dakota War, and I believe we have 44. So over half have to do with the Dakota War pre, during, and post. And there is a, a, a grave site and, and marker with names by Peace Church in New London, the cemetery. Mm-hmm. But that's right next to yep, Peace Church. Yep, that's the Broberg Lundbergs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's a state monument. We have two state monuments in the county, and Broberg Lundberg is one of them. And they were 13 people were killed um, over by Munson Lake State Park. Mm-hmm. And then they were moved to the um, Peace Lutheran Cemetery, Lebanon Cemetery. Um, and the other state monument is Gurry Andreessen, and she's buried in the Vicar Cemetery. And they were given in honor of um, the sacrifice and what they did during that time. Like Gurry saved Solomon Foote and Oscar Erickson um, from, they would have died if she wouldn't have came and saved them and brought them to Forest City. And then uh, the the sacrifice that those 13, and these guys are new settlers. I mean, they were only here a couple years before this happened. And as far as I can tell, most of them had really, really good interactions with the natives. So it was, I'm guessing it was a total surprise of what was going on. And they don't have the newspapers and the social media like we have. So they didn't know what right. was going on down in the river. They only knew the ones that were coming up to hunt and trade mm-hmm. up here in Candy Eye County. So. Is there a best book to read about? The Dakota War? That war. Kenneth Carley's The Dakota War of 1862. That is the one I always recommend everybody start with. It is concise, non-biased. He lays out, this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened, this is what happened. Mm -hmm. Read that first. It has a nice map in it, too. Um, He's updated it through the years. He published it in 1862 at the 100th anniversary, or 1962 at the 100th anniversary. And he keeps updating it to be, you know, editing it and stuff. 
But um, that's the best one to start with. And then you can go start reading all the other stuff and form your opinions. I'm trying to remember which book it is I've read now. If, I don't remember if it's that one or I keep thinking uh, Dakota Dawn. Is that, is that, that, that is a book. Yep. Okay. yep. And that's the one I've read. It. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You should read the Kenneth Carley one, which we do sell in the gift shop too. <laughs> I'm stop by. Yeah. Hey, you're right down the road. <laughs> yeah, you are. You're really close. It's, um, I just ordered some new ones because we're all out, but those they should be here in a couple weeks. Okay. But they're, um, that one is the best book. And, Email and, me when you get it in. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, it's the first one I read. I grew up um, south of Woodlake where the Woodlake Battle mm -hmm. was. My dad actually grew up on the farm where the monument was and stuff. Okay. So that's how I got interested in history was that mm -hmm. story. So I knew what I had heard, but that was this is the first book I read. And it was it's just it's a good place to start. Very yeah. good to know. Yeah. See what you can learn if you just stop by the Historical Society. Exactly. And learn stuff from 10 years ago to 125 or 150 years Ex ago. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Our Very county cool. turns 150 in 2020, so we've been around a while. That's getting close. I know. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, uh, and you have a map at the Historical Society of the markers that are around the county, the yep. plaques with the stories and yep. things. Yep. I know it there are a couple in New London. There's one west of New London on 40, and there's yep. one... West of Spicer off 10. And yep. They're all over. They are. And fall is a beautiful time to go look at them. Um, so you can come. The We sell the book. And in the book, it has all the markers. And it gives more information than what's on the markers. So if you're traveling and you have the book, you can learn a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it's a beautiful. I drive by a couple on my way to work. And with the colors and the leaves, it's a perfect yeah. time to go road tripping and take that uh Take that guide with you and check it out. That's an interesting story. Uh, how we how we have our ancestors growing up and our friends and mm -hmm. their, our friends as families. Uh, uh, it's just amazing how times have changed. Yes. I always think back to where uh, when those people maybe got their first phone. Yes. And as a matter of fact, it was just this past Friday in history. They had the first ever phone line from Chicago to New York. Mm -hmm. They could handle one call at a time. Mm -hmm. Imagine if those people could see today. I know. Wouldn't it be crazy? No, I know. Well, like my grandfather, he was born in 24 and just he had horses. And then he remembers when he got his the first one tractor they had. Mm -hmm. And then to when right before he died, the tractors that he was sitting with my uncle and just to go driving in the field and stuff. It's just and that's only in 90 years. It's ridiculous ridiculous how fast things are changing and that's why yeah. people need to donate things to us <laughs> well we we have to get together on some more topics here in, yeah. in a in a few weeks or a couple three short mm -hmm. months and talk some more this has been bla a blast and a half hour is gone where, yeah. where does it go i know, you know? <laughs> joe Lanutka from the candy Eye county historical society with us appreciate you coming in we'll be talking soon all, all right. right thank you and that is community roundtable today You've been listening to Community Roundtable, a free public service brought to you on AM 1590 KDJS. If you're a member of a nonprofit organization and would like to be featured on the program, call the KDJS Newsline at 320-235-2900. That's 320-235-2900.